Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're connecting from. I'm Ira Feldman. I'm the MEPTECH Executive Director, and I would like to welcome you to today's Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series produced by MEPTECH's MEPTECH and IMAPS. So thank you for joining us. Uh, future presentations, we are working on our uh, next uh, presentation will be on February 24th. We are working on having a hyperscale data center uh, company uh, speak or people from one. Uh, I can't uh, announce it yet, but we will announce as soon as it's all confirmed and uh, it should be a great presentation on February 24th. And then after that on March 10th, we have John Park from Cadence Design Systems. He's gonna talk about how uh, things look from the EDA side as the difference between heterogeneous integration and system in a package. So both of those should be excellent presentations. If you're interested in speaking at a future webinar or uh, luncheon when we can resume, please contact myself or Dave Town. We're happy to have uh, topics related to packaging and test and EDA. Uh, for our audience. So uh, please uh, reach out to us with suggestions. And as far as uh, next events, on uh, February 9th through 11th, uh, we have uh, Too Hot to Test. We're looking at the challenges that large devices create um, with a high, high power to um, the, the thermal challenges during test and how to overcome them. Uh, it is a free event courtesy of our sponsors. We have uh, programs each of the mornings, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the, the 9th through 11th uh, in two weeks. Uh, please register at events.meptech.org and the schedule is there. It should be a great event and uh, looking forward to that very much. In terms of MEPTECH, MEPTECH is a membership supported organization. Uh, if you haven't uh, joined or renewed, please uh, do so today at meptech.org. It helps us do events like this as do sponsorships. So we have multiple levels of sponsorship for both events and the Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series. If you have questions about joining or sponsoring, please reach out to Betty B. Cooper at meptech.org and she can uh, fill you in on the details. So today, uh, the Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series, I am very happy to have Carl Zweiben uh, talk about advanced thermal management materials and low expansion printed circuit boards. Uh, Carl, Carl is an independent consultant who's been involved in advanced thermal management materials for over 35 years. He led an R&D program group at GE, which was the first to use aluminum silicon carbide particle reinforced materials uh, in electronics and uh, photonics thermal management. He's also developed uh, low CTE printed circuit boards. So we'll talk about that topic. And in addition to uh, GE, he's been involved with uh, DuPont, Lockheed Martin, and JPL. Uh, he's very widely published. He's done a lot of consulting and has taught over 200 short courses. And so I'm uh, very knowledgeable in this area and we're very happy to have you, Carl. So let me turn it over to you. Sire, it's a pleasure to be here today and hello to everybody. Thanks for attending. I'm gonna talk about today, there'll be a brief introduction to the problem. We'll then look at traditional thermal management materials followed by advanced thermal management materials. We'll look at some applications, then future directions, and finally, of course, summary and conclusions. Reducing size, weight, and power is a key driver for many aerospace defense applications and commercial applications as well. So thermal management is a critical issue in developing these systems and reducing uh, size, weight, and power. In addition to heat dissipation, thermal stresses are a major problem in thermal management, which result in warping, fracture, fatigue, failure, and creep. And of course, in photonics, deformation is an important consideration. 
If we look at thermal stresses, one of the basic problems in thermal management, we find that it's caused primarily by differences in coefficient of thermal expansion between components. And this is an old Air Force chart dating from the 1980s that illustrates that fact. So it's the thermal stress problem has been with us for a long time. So weight is an important consideration for certainly for aerospace and defense systems, but also for portable commercial and consumer systems. Furthermore, systems that are subject to vibration loads and also shop, uh, shock and drop loads during shipping, uh, also other areas where weight is important. And of course, cost is always a critical issue. Thermal management problems are similar for all semiconductors, both electronic and photonic. We have uh, some examples here. And advanced thermal materials are widely used in many of these applications. If we look at traditional thermal materials, they turn out to be inadequate for many applications, certainly for meeting our, our goal of reducing size, weight, and power. They date from the mid 20th century. They impose severe design limitations and some are, are expensive. In response to these problems, there are an increasing number of advanced materials. They have thermal conductivities up to 1700 watts per meter Kelvin, which is greater than four times that of copper. Most of them have low CTEs. They have low densities compared to uh, copper. They are in various stages of development from R&D to large volume production. And it turns out that some are actually cheaper than traditional materials. So here's one example of the payoff from using advanced uh, thermal materials. OIPEC and Finion reports that replacing a copper uh, base plate in an IGBT module with ALSIC which is a aluminum reinforced with silicon carbide particles. It matches the CTE of the aluminum nitride substrate, eliminates solder joint failure, and increases the lifetime from 10 to 30 years. So here's an ultrasonic image scan of the baseline copper base plate on the left. And on the right, we have the ALSIC base plate after 20,000 cycles. And as you can see with copper, they, there's a failure of the uh, solder uh, attachment, but there's no failure of the solder joint in the uh, ALSIC with the ALSIC base plate. And the authors of the paper concluded that the failure mechanism, which is fatigue cracking, does not exist any longer. So there are numerous traditional and new thermal materials. And I find that many engineers are only familiar with copper and aluminum and, and not even uh, familiar with traditional low expansion materials that we'll be talking about. This presentation is a brief abbreviation of a, of a one day short course that I teach. So we've had to cut out a lot of materials and I, I'm, I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. So the focus of this seminar is going to be on heat spreading materials that are used in modules, heat sinks, base plates, enclosures, etc. And we'll also talk about printed circuit boards with low coefficients of thermal expansion, CTEs. So Carl, just a, a quick question. I mean, is the, the ideal case is always to have a CTE match of what you're mating, or is there cases where you want the, let's say the heat spreader to be a lower CTE than what you're connecting it to? Well, generally you're, try, you're trying to match the CTE of various components. Although for, uh, for an optical system where you're concerned about deformation, what you want is a, is a material perhaps with zero coefficient of expansion. So there's no deformation at all. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that later on. Thank you. This is an adaptation, again, of an old Air Force chart showing the various levels of uh, packaging. Level one is a package. Level two is a printed circuit board assembly or a support plate. Level three is a subsystem or enclosure or box. And finally, I've added level four, which is a support structure. And advanced materials are being used in all of these. So let's take a look at traditional thermal management materials. Uh, I start looking at um, semiconductors and 
uh, ceramic substrate. And uh, you'll see that I have a, a range of CTEs for all these materials. And what I've done is gone through a lot of papers and uh, manufacturers data, handbooks and so forth. And I presented a range of the CTEs for these various materials. And when I worked at GE, um, the CTEs that different groups were, were, were using varied by as much as 100%. In any event, if we look at all these semiconductors and ceramic substrates, the range of CTEs is two to seven parts per million per degree Kelvin. So that's the range that we would like to match. So here we have a chart of traditional uh, thermal management materials. Um, we have copper and aluminum at the top, and they have pretty good thermal conductivities, but as we'll see, they have high CTEs. And then we have a range of materials, traditional materials with low CTEs, but they have thermal conductivities no better than aluminum. And finally, we, we have uh, uh, e-glass polymer printed circuit boards, and they have high, C, relatively high CTEs. And again, the range of, of properties, uh, CTE properties that I find in handbooks and papers and so forth, ranges from 12 to 24 parts per million per degree Kelvin. In addition, these materials are pretty much thermal insulators, thermal conductivities in the range of 0.3 to 1 watt per meter Kelvin. So let's look at aluminum. The, the main problem with aluminum for packaging is that it has a high CTE, 23 parts per million per degree Kelvin. Result is thermal stresses and warping, and it requires the use of underfills and or compliant thermal interface materials, which we call TIMS, such as greases, uh, polymeric TIMS, and soft solders. Uh, aluminum's got a pretty good thermal conductivity, 200 watts per meter Kelvin, but we certainly would prefer higher values in many applications. We look at copper, the main problem is the high CTE combined with high density, uh, 8.9 grams per cubic centimeter, which is about three times that of aluminum. It's got a good thermal conductivity, 400 watts per meter Kelvin, but again, we would like higher values if we can get them. And as you'll see, we can with advanced materials. So if we look at, at the various TIMS thermal interface materials that we use, starting with greases, they are messy to apply, they're subject to dry out and pump out, and also, also silicone migration. There are many other polymeric compliant uh, TIMS or compliant polymeric TIMS. And what we find is that they are often the greatest contributor to total system thermal resistance, which is a, which is a major problem. If we look at, at soft solders, uh, which are compliant, mostly indium based, because they have a low yield stress, which is why they're called soft, they have poor fatigue life. They're also subject to creep, creep into metallic formation, corrosion, and electro migration, and they're fairly expensive. If we look at traditional low CTE materials, they all have significant deficiencies. We look at Covor, Alloy 42, titanium, materials like that. They also have low thermal conductivities, less than, seven, less than or equal to about 17 parts per million per degree Kelvin compared to 200 for aluminum. Except for titanium, they also have high densities and they're hard to machine. We have uh, other low, low expansion materials, copper tungsten, copper moly, those are actually metal composites rather than alloys because there's no dissol dissolving of the molybdenum in the copper or vice versa. And then we have copper invar copper, which is a, a laminate. So they have thermal conductivities pretty much less than or equal to aluminum. They have high densities, they're hard to machine, and most of them are expensive. If we look at uh, compliant thermal interface materials and solders. Here we have the thermal resistance. This is a paper, a somewhat old paper from uh, Dan Blazage, but uh, the results are still pretty much the same that solder have the lowest thermal resistance compared to the uh, polymeric TIMS. 
So the bottom line is, the takeaway is that we would like to use direct attach with hard solders to minimize the thermal resistance, but that usually requires a CTE match. Otherwise you get high uh, stresses. If we look at printed circuit boards, um, e-glass polymer printed circuit boards, very widely used in the industry, of course, they all have high CTEs, again, in the range of 12 to 24 parts per million per degree Kelvin. As a result, we get high thermal stresses and warping, failures of solder joints, and fa actual failures of ceramics. And to get around this, we typically require uh, underfills. If we, look, if we look at a historical usage for many decades, copper invar copper constraining layers were used with e-glass printed circuit board to reduce the, the coefficient of expansion of the printed circuit board. And the copper invar copper also adds thermal conductivity to the printed circuit board. However, we have advanced materials that can serve the same function as the copper invar copper offer higher thermal conductivities and lower densities. And we'll take a look at one example later on. So we've looked at advanced, uh, sorry, we looked at traditional thermal management materials and their limitations. This leads us to a discussion of advanced thermal management materials. So in response to the limitations of traditional materials, new materials are steadily emerging. Many have high thermal conductivities up to 1700 watts per meter Kelvin, which again is it's um, greater than four times that of copper. They have low CTEs, low densities, and they are at various stages of development from R&D to large volume production. And uh, as I mentioned, I have a sh short one day short course that covers a lot of materials but because of time limitations, uh, I have to uh, limit the discussion of the materials. So we can divide advanced materials into two broad categories. Monolithic carbonaceous materials, which are pure carbon. And then we have a variety of composite materials. I define a composite material as two materials that are bonded together that distinguishes composites from alloys, uh, metal alloys, for example, where one material is dissolved in another. If we look at composites, uh, they have been used in packaging for many years. For example, FR4 printed circuit boards are a composite consisting of woven glass fibers in an epoxy matrix. Copper tungsten, again, is a composite and a rather than an alloy. So that, that, that's a metal composite. If we look at the classes of composite materials, we have polymer matrix, metal matrix, carbon matrix, and ceramic matrix. At this point in time, monolithic carbons and metal matrix composites are the key advanced thermal management materials. So let's start looking at monolithic carbonaceous materials. Uh, we start with flexible graphite, which there are two uh, subcategories, exfoliated natural graphite, sorry, exfoliated natural graphite and pyrolytic graphite. These are flexible foil-like materials, highly anisotropic. If we look at in-plane thermal conductivities, they range from 140 to 1500. And in the vertical or through thickness direction, they're much lower, three to 10. And if we look at CTEs, these, these materials actually have negative coefficients of expansion. That's not a mistake. One of the <laughs> characteristics of carbon is that in some forms it has, has negative coefficients of thermal expansion, at least in the in-plane direction. In the vertical or through thickness direction, the CTEs are positive. And the densities you'll notice are much lower than aluminum, aluminum is 2.7, and we have densities ranging from 1.1 to 1.9. At the upper end of, of the uh, spectrum of carbonaceous materials, we have highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, which have thermal conductivities as high as 1700 watts per meter Kelvin in, in the in-plane direction. 
the through thickness direction at much lower, about 25. And again, negative in plane CTEs. And densities that are higher than the flexible graphite, but still lower than aluminum. This brings us to composite materials. And again, at this point, mostly metal matrix composites. If we look at the various types of reinforcements, we have continuous fibers. Continuous fibers can be converted to fabrics and braids. Um, so for example, a, a, a uh, FR4 is a glass fabric in, in a, poly a polymeric matrix, uh, in this case, epoxy. We also have discontinuous fibers and whiskers. CNT stands for carbon nanotubes. And we have particles and platelets. So this gives us a wide range of reinforcements that we can combine with matrix materials to form unique composites with tailored properties. One of the things I highlight in my short courses is that one of the big advantages of composites is the ability to tailor properties. So here we're trying to tailor thermal conductivity and coefficient of expansion combined with low density. Let's take a look at ALSIC, which is aluminum reinforced with silicon carbide particles. This is the first, what I'm calling the first advanced thermal management material. The work was started in 1980s by uh, my uh, R&D group uh, at General Electric. ALSIC is now well established in commercial and aerospace applications. It's now made by a variety of processes and manufacturers. I think there are at least a dozen now. Some processes are net shape, which means no machining, and they can be cheaper than copper tungsten and copper moly. And one type reportedly is cheaper than copper. Uh, I, I can't substantiate that, but that's what the manufacturer claims. And as I showed earlier, uh, work at OIPEC and Finion uh, showed that by matching the CTE, they could eliminate fatigue failure, increasing a lifetime in an IGBT module from 10 to 30 years. So this chart shows the coefficient of thermal expansion of ALSIC, which is aluminum reinforced with silicon carbide particles, as a function of particle volume fraction. And we have two types of processes, uh, powder metallurgy, that is these square uh, points. And with, square, with the powder metallurgy process, you can go up to a particle volume fraction of about 55%. But with the development of infiltration processes, you can go up to over 80% uh, particle volume fraction, and the CTE gets down pretty close to that of silicon. So, so as I mentioned, there are a variety of manufacturers of, of ALSIC. They have uh, materials with a variety of particle volume fractions. Thermal conductivities range from 132 to 255 quite a wide range of CTEs. But you notice at the lower end, the CTEs do fall in the range of three to seven parts per million per degree Kelvin, which is our goal to match CTEs of semiconductors and ceramics. You notice the density is in the range of aluminum. As the particle volume fraction goes up, the uh, density goes up, but it's still no more than about 10% higher than that of aluminum. The modulus also increases. Aluminum has a modulus of 70 gigapascals. And so we get higher moduli with, with these composites than we do with aluminum. And uh, this is a widely used, this is so far the most successful commercial advanced uh, thermal management material. However, the thermal conductivities are still in the range of aluminum and we would like higher values. To get higher values, we look at uh, different reinforcements. Here we have uh, graphite particles, graphite platelets, and you see two, mod two uh, different materials, thermal conductivities of as high as 750 watts per meter Kelvin in plane. So it's approaching twice that of copper. And this material is also anisotropic and the through thickness thermal conductivities are in the range of 30. 35 watts per meter Kelvin. 
but you notice the in-plane CTEs are, are in the range of interest. And we also have a density advantage compared to uh, aluminum. That's because the uh, graphite particles have lower density than aluminum. I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. The next class of materials are metals reinforced with diamond particles. Now, when I first uh, heard about diamond particle reinforced metals being used in packaging, I was certainly very skeptical because we tend to think of diamonds as extremely expensive materials. However, if you, if you look at industrial applications, we find that diamond particle reinforced metals have been used in a variety of industrial applications. So on the left, we have diamond particle reinforced copper grinding wheels. And on the right, we have diamond particle reinforced cobalt rock drill bits. And so, and these have been used in uh, industrial applications for decades. So when I worked at DuPont, we had a term called value in use. And I would argue that diamond reinforced composite metal composites have value and use in ele high end electronics that probably surpass that of, of the use in, in uh, grinding wheels or rock drill bits. In any event, they're certainly worth looking at. And so we'll does, sorry. sorry, Carl, does the diamond actually give structural strength to the material or it increases the conductivity? You may be addressing it on the next slide, but. Uh, it probably increases the, uh, certainly it increases the modulus. I, I'm not sure about strength properties. I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but usually in, uh, in commercial, in our thermal management applications, we don't worry about the strength of the, uh, of the heat spreaders. But uh, again, I, I've got it in, in my notes. I'd have to go back and look at it. By the way, if anybody has any, any uh, questions after the uh, seminar, I have my email on the, on the lead slide. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So we have commercial materials now with a variety of matrix materials. Uh, copper, aluminum, silver, cobalt, with diamond, par diamond particles. And one of the advantages of these composites is that they're isotropic. That is, the properties are the same in every direction, whereas the carbonaceous materials are highly anisotropic. So we find thermal conductivities as in experimental materials as high as 983 watts per meter Kelvin. And CTEs, uh, many of which can be in the range, the goal range of, of three to seven or four to seven parts per million critigree Kelvin. And notice that we also have density advantages uh, compared to copper, which is about nine uh, grams per cubic centimeter. So again, if we look at our goal of high thermal conductivity, low CTE and low density, the diamond composites certainly look very attractive. Do you want to take some packaging questions before you go on to printed circuit boards? Sure. 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 Okay. Um, so I, I see that there's a few here. Um, actually, let's talk about um, what, what, uh, Peter's asking about graphene particles embedded in copper. Is that, um, are people looking at things like that, graphene? People are looking at graphene, carbon nanotubes, all, all uh, carbon fibers, and so forth. Okay, and the, but is a, the class of performance similar to the you know, it's well, it's probably similar to some of the other things that you're looking at. And but would those be anisotropic or would they be more directional than the graphene? I would think they would be similar to the graphite platelet copper, for example, which is highly anisotropic. Okay. 
And uh, another general question about, we were talking about the, the diamond um, MMCs, the high conductivity, wh where does that come? The question was, where does the high conductivity in diamond MMCs come from? Well, if you look at uh, diamond films, which have been used in thermal management for many years as well, they have thermal conductivities as high as 2000 watts per meter Kelvin. So uh, diamond, uh, ha ha diamond particles, depending on the purity, can have very high thermal conductivities. And that's where the thermal conductivity is coming from in the diamond composites. So it's, it's analogous to what we saw with the uh, silicon carbide particle reinforced aluminum, except that the diamond particles have much higher thermal conductivities. Yeah. And um, talking uh, more about anisotropic, uh, there's a question here. Does the fact that some MMCs are anisotropic cause stress in other directions, especially if you have a wide area that you're interfacing to? Um, not necessarily. It, it, it's going to depend on the, on the geometry of the, of the component. You know, for example, if I um, apply a, um, a laminate, if I apply a, uh, an anisotropic layer to a printed circuit board, if, uh, if I match the coefficient, well, if I match the coefficient of expansion of the printed circuit board with the uh, composite layer in, in the in-plane direction, there will be no thermal stresses. So it's, it's going to depend on the geometry. OK, got it. Um, let's talk about, you know, I, I think there's a few here uh, relating all, you know, I think diamonds have caught people's attention. Uh, so the, you know, it has interesting properties, but, you know, questions about how machinable it is or how practical it is to form into a heat sink. Or, for example, related to that, you know, they look like good fits for packaging, but are there factors that prevent their, you know, their wide adoption? So I, the, we worked on, the, we worked on diamond, or with, I should say, we worked with diamond reinforced aluminum 30 years ago at General Electric. And that was much too early. The diamond particles were not adhering to the matrix. And uh, so they, although they've been around a lot, they have not had a lot of um, production applications. Um, I, I guess with the one exception that, that uh, there's some, some Japanese materials of diamond particle reinforced copper that have been around for a long time. So I, th I think in terms of you know, high volume application, we're still at a fairly early stage but I'll, I'll show you some applications later on um, that may answer some of those questions. Okay. Okay. And I think there's some questions about generically about packages and things like that. So um, I, I think those will go pretty well with your application um, slides. So may, let's let's maybe cover the PCBs. Okay. We talked about um, the fact that e-glass polymer printed circuit boards have high CTEs. And uh, we, at, at least at General Electric and, and in some parts of the industry, we're able to reduce the coefficient of expansion of the printed circuit board using copper invar copper constraining layers. But we now have uh, printed circuit boards where instead of glass fibers, we're using aramids and they have low in-plane CTEs in the range of seven to nine parts per million per Kelvin. And I'll show you an application later on. And, and instead of using copper in our copper, we can also use some of these advanced thermal management materials that are potential replacements for copper in our copper. And I'll show you an example later on. So here's, a, uh, here's one possible constraining layer, which consists of an ultra high thermal conductivity carbon fibers in, an, in a polymer like epoxy. The laminate geometry where the fibers oriented at zero 90 degrees will have an in-plane thermal conductivity 
in the range of 300 watts per meter Kelvin. Coefficient of in plane coefficient of thermal expansion to minus one. And that, that combined with the high modulus, which is actually much higher than aluminum, provides the constraint. And also, we notice it has a much lower density than aluminum and certainly much lower than copper and var copper. So let's take a look at some applications. I may answer some of the questions that people have and I'll certainly be happy to take more questions later on. Here we have a range of applications where flexible graphite is being used in a, a variety of electronic and photonic applications such as uh, uh, LED solid state uh, lighting and uh, displays. I mentioned highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, and here we have a, an aluminum uh, aluminum enclosure, complex aluminum enclosure, where the highly oriented pyrolytic graphite is being inserted in regions where we need heat spreading. So with a typical enclosure, we don't necessarily need heat spreading, heat spreading uh, throughout. And so we can selectively uh, reinforce or selectively place our, uh, heat, our heat spreader material. And we see regions uh, of circular regions of pure aluminum. And this is a way to get heat into the highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, which has a low through thickness thermal conductivity. And uh, sometimes these are called heat slugs. If we look at metal composites, this, this is a, these are moly copper uh, components, which are actually uh, metal composites rather than alloys. And these go back uh, many decades. So this is the first ALSIC module. ALSIC, again, silicon carbide particle reinforced aluminum module. Uh, about 1985, this is the work uh, that my uh, R&D group at GE was doing, uh, my R&D group at GE was doing. And what we had was, a, we had a spacecraft which had um, many, many microwave modules. There was a big weight problem on, on the spacecraft. There were hundreds of modules and they were all made of Kovar which has a fairly high density and also a very low thermal conductivity. So again, uh, we're trying to uh, replace this, this traditional low expansion thermal management material with a metal matrix composite. And in this case, we chose ALSIC and we found a weight savings of about 65%, or 10 times the thermal conductivity of copper. Never went into production because of the Crovar package was qualified and the money was not available to, uh, to uh, qualify the, the composite. But we published a paper on this in the 80s and this stim stimulated a lot of interest in the industry. So here we have some work from a, a company called LEC. Uh, at the top, we see silicon carbide particles in a block of aluminum. And this is what we're calling a hybrid module, which has a Kovar lead frame with an ALSIC base. And the ALSIC base matches the CTE of the Kovar and provides the thermal conductivity in the base, which is where you need it. So you can combine materials. And ALSIC has been used in uh, a variety of production applications. Uh, here are some examples. And this is a... Uh, from a company called Thermal Transfer Composites. I don't think that the Toyota Prius is using ALSIC at the present time, uh, but it was at least in some models. These are ALSIC lids, and I believe these are all net shaped lids made of aluminum reinforced with silicon carbide particles by a net shape process that does not require any machining. This is, this is a good example of the weight savings potential with advanced materials. And we actually used a module like this in one of our GE spacecraft. 
So it's it's a power uh, module. The, the original base plate was uh, copper tungsten and the manufacturer replaced the copper tungsten with ALSIC with a weight savings of about 85%. Now my primary uh, background is in structural composites. It's, it's very, very rare. As a matter of fact, I can't think of a particular application where we demonstrated a weight saving of 85% compared to the baseline material. But with a direct substitution of one material for another in, in electronic packaging, we can see these very high weight savings. So here's an example of a liquid cooled heat sink uh, made by CPS Technologies. And again, this is an ALSIC material. We can combine uh, advanced materials uh, the way we did uh, I showed you earlier combining highly oriented pyrolytic graphite with monolithic aluminum in a complex enclosure. Here we have uh, ALSIC combined with highly oriented pyrolytic graphite in a uh, pedestal. And if we look at the bottom, it's a cross section and TPG is a, a trademark for uh, thermal pyrolytic graphite, which is one form of highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. So we're taking advantage of this heat, spread, heat spreading ability of the material uh, combined with the low CTE of the ALSIC package. Another example, carbon fiber reinforced aluminum uh, metal matrix composite. And this, this has been used in a um, aircraft, I'm sorry, spacecraft phased array and uh, antennas. So here is an example of uh, our diamond particle reinforced copper composite. And these are some, some lids uh, made from that composite. And here we have a, uh, an another hybrid, hybrid type of a package. It's made of titanium, which has a low coefficient of thermal expansion, but also a low CTE, I'm uh, sorry, low thermal conductivity. So in regions where, of the package where we need high thermal conductivity, uh, diamond particle reinforced aluminum, sorry, diamond for, particle reinforced copper had, has been used as inserts. And uh, this is a good example of using an advanced thermal ma material where you really need it. And it's especially uh, significant when the material is fairly expensive as diamond particle composites are at the present time. But this is a this package is, as far as I know, is in serial production. This is an experimental package um, consisting of uh, a base plate made of diamond particle reinforced silver, which again has a high thermal conductivity combined with a low coefficient of expansion and a lower density than silver or copper. Thermal conductivity here is 600 uh, watts per meter Kelvin. And again, that's isotropic. This is an example of a, uh, an aramid fiber reinforced polymer uh, printed circuit board as a multi-layer printed circuit board. And again, this has a low CTE and this is a, uh, as far as I know, a production application. I mentioned the other, another approach to um, producing a low CTE printed circuit board material is to take e-glass and uh, an e-glass reinforced polymer system and add a constraining layer. In this case, the constraining layer instead of copper and var copper is a carbon fiber reinforced polymer composite. And this, uh, as, as far as I know, was used in an actual spacecraft uh, application. Um, the carbon fiber here, carbon fiber constraining layer here is different uh, from the one that I uh, showed earlier on. So, so one of the things to consider is that we have a large number of carbon fibers, many of which are not particularly thermally conductive. So, uh, but we do have the ability to use uh, carbon fibers with high thermal conductivities combined with high stiffness and low density. This is uh, 
one of the most interesting applications that I uh, would ever been involved in. This was a, a photovoltaic uh, array for a spacecraft. It was an experimental array. And the idea was that the incoming light uh, solar energy is reflected off a mirror and onto a high efficiency gallium arsenide photovoltaic cell. And to uh, dissipate the waste heat, the um, gallium, ars gallium arsenide photovoltaic cell was mounted in a ber beryllium oxide block. And the next problem was getting the heat out of the beryllium oxide block. And that was done by transferring it uh, through a solder joint to what, what are called spiders that supported the uh, beryllium oxide block. Problem was that the aluminum has a much higher coefficient of thermal expansion, resulting in failure of the solder joint. So what we did was to design a carbon fiber reinforced aluminum composite, which had a coefficient of expansion that matched that of the, of the beryllium oxide block and once we uh, attached the beryllium oxide block to the low expansion uh, carbon fiber reinforced aluminum spiders, it eliminated failure of the solder joint that resulted from a difference in coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, finally, in terms of applications, uh, I mentioned that support structures are also an area of application of of uh, advanced materials. Here we have a, an optical bench, composite optical bench for a spacecraft that is composed of thermally conductive carbon fibers in an epoxy matrix. And the, the big advantage here is that it gives you a near zero CTE, significant weight savings compared to the baseline aluminum. So again, we have a wide variety of materials with unique properties that give the design engineer a, a great potential for uh, improved performance and weight savings. If we look at future directions, it's undoubted that uh, undoubted the fact that thermal management will continue to be a problem. Uh, Jan Van Arteman gave a talk about a month ago and she was talking about a system where the heat dissipation was a thousand um, kilowatts. I'm sorry, it was, was one kilowatt. Uh, getting heat out of a system like that is certainly a big problem. We're going to 3D architecture, which only adds to the complexity of thermal management. So as a result, I am expecting to see continuing development of new materials, both monolithic carbonaceous and composites. We have a variety of reinforcements. Here are some examples, carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, which have thermal conductivities as high as 6,000 watts per meter Kelvin. Graphite platelets, I showed you a graphite platelet reinforced aluminum earlier. They have thermal conductivities as high as 1,500 watts per meter Kelvin. Carbon fibers, diamond particles, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, diamond particles have thermal conductivities as high as 2000 watts per meter Kelvin. So all of the materials that we talked about so far have been carbonaceous materials and metal composites, which are electrically conductive. I think there's considerable potential for electrically insulating composite materials, which are also thermally conductive. Um, I don't know of any at the present time, but I think that's certainly an area that, that merits consideration. And uh, numerous other materials are, poten are potentially of interest. So to summarize, thermal management is a critical problem in both electronic and photonic systems. It consists of heat dissipation and also thermal stresses arising from CTE mismatch. Size, weight, and power are critical issues in both commercial and, and uh, consumer applications. We've seen that traditional thermal materials have significant deficiencies. In response to those deficiencies, we find an increasing number of advanced thermal materials with thermal conductivities as high as 1700 watts per meter, watts per meter Kelvin in production. 
combined with low CTEs, low densities. Some are actually cheaper than traditional materials. As, as a result of all these characteristics, applications are increasing steadily. And finally, uh, if we look at the history of materials, uh, steels go back to biblical times. And uh, in terms of thermal management materials, I believe we are truly in the early stages of a material, of a thermal materials revolution. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Carl. Great. Um, so let's maybe start with a higher order question before diving into some of the details. I mean, so there, there's a huge menu or a lot of options to choose from, but uh, certain suppliers seem to have a limited repertoire. So obviously, if a packaging engineer knows that there's better solutions, maybe you can push, but what's, what's gating the adoption of some of this advanced material for, let's say, more broad, wide scale adoption? Well, it's, it's the, uh, the driver of uh, SWAP, size, weight, and power. It's the customer demanding light, lightweight systems with higher thermal loads. So if the customer isn't pushing, the suppliers are not gonna do what it takes to, to use these advanced materials. Yeah, and, and, and consumers are certainly concerned about weight as well as size. So there are commercial drivers as well as, uh, as, well as military. Uh, I mean, if we look at, at advanced composites historically in the structural area, which is my, my first background, they were used first in aerospace applications. If we look at carbon fiber reinforced uh, epoxy materials, they were fused, first used in fighter aircraft, later on commercial aircraft. They are now used in thousands and thousands of commercial applications. Uh, sailboats, um, skis, and so forth. So it, I, I expect to see the same thing. Or we have seen the same thing with advanced thermal management materials. First being used in, in military in, in applications and eventually making their way into uh, uh, industrial applications. I guess the, in addition to the ALSEC, the uh, flexible graphite that I showed you, all of those applications were commercial applications. And it was the, the uh, driver of heat dissipation and weight uh, and size uh, that were driving the use of those materials. Great. Um, uh, Mark was asking, um, do you have a approximate market size for thermal MMCs? I mean, or his guess is 200 to 300 million a year. Or are we, do, do you have a feel for how big this market is or is? I, I don't. I, however, the last couple of years, I have seen some market studies that purport to, uh, to look at that issue. However, I would be very cautious because I've, over the years, I've found that market studies tend to be overly optimistic. I mean, nobody's gonna buy a market study that says the market's gonna shrink. Right, okay, okay. Um, I think we talked about that. Um, any, any sort of gen uh, generic recommendations for you know, you know, uh, this per person was asking, uh, Romain was asking, you know, eight watts, 20 by 20 millimeters square sort of footprint uh, for a space or if, uh, actually for space, uh, or is it too customer application case specific? I mean, are there any sort of low hanging fruits that are generically applicable or, or do you have to look at all the parameters to decide uh, whether you need to use advanced materials? Well, it, my, my approach is, I think this, this is something I emphasize in the short course. I, the way I look at it is this, advanced materials give the design engineer a greater range of options. 
So good engineering dictates that what you do is you do your design trades, look at the cost issues, look at the maturity of the material and a possible need for some uh, R&D work. And uh, you do your engineering studies and you select your material just as you would with any of the traditional materials. So there's, there's no, there's never, in my experience, I've never come across any application where there was only one material that would work. There was always uh, design trades and, and usually more than one material that would work in a given application. So again, you, you do your design trades and select what you think is the uh, best material for the application. Got it. Okay. Um, this one you may or may not know, but um, do you have a, from your your work um, whether you have a, you know the, you talked about tims which are important for cooling a device, but a lot of the heat could maybe flow through the device pins. Um, and this is a specific question on BGA packaging. Uh, any idea as to what percentage goes out? through the pins versus out through the, the heat sink? Is that something you can address? Well, I guess in most of the commercial applications that I'm familiar with, you've got a package and you attach a heat sink on top. And the heat sink primarily uh, is the primary method for heat transfer. And in military applications, on the other hand, it's typical, it's common to use um, heat sinks embedded in the printed circuit board or attached to the printed circuit board. They're called thermal planes or printed circuit board heat sinks. And in that case, the, uh, the heat flow goes through the, uh, through the heat sink uh, or the cold plate to the edge of the printed circuit board assembly and therefore into, and then from there into the enclosure. So uh, there are these two different methods of uh, heat transfer in uh, commercial and uh, military electronics. Got it. Um, on the, the low CTE PCBs, is there, you know, and I, I know this is a general, I mean, is there an approximate cost difference between, you know, constructing, let's say out of FR4 or switching to some of these more, um, lower CTE materials, just any rules of thumb or? Well, at this point, I only know of the one commercial material, uh, printed circuit board material with a low CTE, and that is the Aramid fiber uh, reinforced printed circuit boards. I, I don't have a, a feel for the, uh, the cost differential. I've never used them uh, myself. Well, actually at GE many years ago, we did develop um, Kevlar 49 fiber fabric reinforced printed circuit boards, which were in production in some GE uh, applications for a while. Um, the other approach, as I mentioned, is to use uh, fiberglass uh, printed circuit boards like, like FR4 material with a constraining layer. And the constraining layer could be uh, uh, thermally conductive carbon fibers, or it could be carbon fibers that are not necessarily thermally conductive if you don't need to transfer heat through the printed circuit board. And, and those could be fairly inexpensive if we didn't use the uh, thermally conductive fibers. The thermally conductive fibers tend to be uh, expensive, but uh, there are uh, commercial carbon fibers that are fairly uh, inexpensive. Good, good to know. Um, it looks like there are far more questions queued up here than, than we have time for. So I, I will send you the question list and, uh, but uh, if people have specific questions, maybe they should reach out to you. Uh, you have your contact info up on the screen. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I wanna thank you very much for an excellent presentation and thank you for entertaining all the questions that we did get to. So thank you, Carl. I'd like to thank you and uh, thank everybody that attended for their for their time. Okay. Uh, so uh, once again, a reminder: uh, February twenty fourth, we'll have our next uh, 
in uh, speaker series uh, presentation. Uh, it promises to be a great presentation. We'll announce it as soon as all the details are confirmed. Uh, March 10th is John Park from Cadence Design Systems. And please, uh, if you haven't taken a look at the schedule or registered for uh, Too Hot to Test, where we'll talk about thermal management um, of the devices Y testing, uh, February 9th to 11th, uh, please do so. You can see the schedule and register at events.meptech.org. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you.